much, and uh, you know, stop by and visit with us. Uh, you'll uh, you'll hear us in the near future. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I was just curious, uh, are you working with the, there was a local, couple of local chapters in Missouri here for Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association. Most of the, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess we got in here. Yeah, that's a good question. One, two, three, four. Four or five, okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, VHBA is, uh, is yeah, we work together with them, yes. Okay. All right, we, uh, because... Of course, there's a lot of the guys there that uh, I, you know, I mean, I'm probably one of the younger ones. I caught the tail end of it. Uh, <laughs> what? One of the younger ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. June, what are you doing out of your booth? Uh, I'm taking a break. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, Likely story. All right, well. But there's a. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, uh, there's nowhere in the world that you can crawl into a gunship and go for a ride today as a civilian. That's true. Okay. But you can. That's what I want so, No, you guys did great. Like I said, uh, they were at both of our Spirit Air Shows the last two years, and those helicopters just, just constantly Family. flew. Just rides, 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 all yeah. day, all, all evening. Yeah, well, it's, so. Typically throughout the year, we, we carry over 10,000 passengers. Oh. I believe that. Well, good job. I'm glad you guys are here and getting established, and, and we'll help you out. So, all right, uh, let's move right along here. Let's see. Last thing I've got as a note is uh, we'll put this on the Facebook page. Uh, Bontair Air Festival coming up on August 19th to the 21st, so a three-day event, and that will include on August 21st the solar eclipse. And that's at 10 a.m. So they're, they're set up for a big festival down there. And if you get a chance, go down to Bonterre Airport and enjoy that. So, all right. So let me see. Oh, I've got the clicker. Hang on. I think I have the clicker. What happened to the clicker? Oh, it's here it is. I don't know. Let's see if I, now, how do I do this thing? Let's see if I can screw it up. Hang on. Hey, it works. That's an F-111. Okay. So, <laughs> I forgot where I got that picture at, but I thought it was pretty neat. Wanted to throw it in there. It's uh, one of the Australian birds. So, 50 years ago this week, very, very controversial at the time, but unique aircraft became part of the U.S. Air Force inventory. Of course, 1967, summer, was it? part of the Vietnam War. So this airplane here, as you'll see in the next few slides, was uh, had a long gestation period, let's just put it that way. And we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, it went on to become a very, very successful aircraft uh, in later years. You guys probably remember 86, the Libya raid. It was, it was highly successful. That was like a 13, 14 hour mission, if I remember right, because they had to fly. They couldn't go direct. They had to fly around all the other countries, around Spain and Portugal and stuff. Uh, and then, of course, in Desert Storm, 91. It's hard to believe it's been 25 years since Desert Storm, but it has. And they were very successful in launching attacks out of Saudi Arabia into Iraq and taking out Saddam Hussein's communications. So what I'm going to do is uh, we also have two very, very special men here tonight, and I will introduce them in a minute, but let's take a little look at the history of the F-111 to start with, and I'll run you through these slides. Okay, so I'm going to have to get over here where I can read, because I, 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 I tried to memorize it, but I couldn't. Okay, so uh, there's kind of some quick facts here. I hope I'm not in anybody's way. Uh, like I say, it's one of the most... Oh, one of the most controversial fighter attack aircraft ever developed, but hampered initially by multi-role, multi-service requirements. Of the 1,726 aircraft that were planned in 1962, only 562 aircraft were ever built. Out of that 562, seven different, seven different variants were uh, 
were made out of that, and that was the program in in 1976. Uh, even with the protracted development period, the 111 became one of the best all-weather interdiction aircraft and established the best safety record of all the Century Series jets. That would be the F-100 through the F-110, and only 77 aircraft lost in a million flying hours. Okay, uh, it was the first. Uh, had several firsts. First production aircraft with variable sweep wings, had train following radar, first after burning turbofan engines, and an escape pod for the crew, which as you will see is our Missouri connection because those escape pods were designed and built by McDonnell Aircraft right here at Lambert Airport. A so. little bit of quick history. The Germans, and there was even some variants before this, but the Germans uh, tried with this Messerschmitt, it never flew obviously, then the war was over, but it had variable sweep wings, or at least they were going to try it out. Bell Aircraft got with the designer of that aircraft and actually came up with the Bell X-5, which is basically a carbon copy of that German plane. And you can see there in the image how the wings are sweeping back and forth. Grumman tried their hand in a Navy jet uh, with the swing wings. It was very unstable. They only built one, I think, and that was, that was it called the XF-10 Jaguar. But then there were some successful aircraft out of after the F-111, that namely being the F-14 Tomcat, and currently still flying the B-1 Bomber. You should also note the B-1 had an escape pod that I was referencing there as well, but they went back to ejection seats in the current models. Okay, so I'll try to run through some of these facts here. So June of 1960, you got to remember what happened in, anybody remember what happened in May of 1960? Uh, U-2 shoot down with Francis Gary Powers, right? So you got to realize that at the time, this is the height of the military industrial complex, or, in the, or almost at its zenith. And then the conflict with Russia, which led to the Bay of Pigs, led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was not, it was not a good time. <laughs> If with relations. Everybody's talking about Russia, 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 everything right now. Well, we should have lived back then and seen how it was. So, uh, basically the Air Force was looking ahead and they issued a, re a request. Uh, they wanted an attack aircraft already looking to replace like the F-100 and some of those planes which really hadn't been in service very long. But uh, they're looking ahead to the future. There's like, by 1964, we would like an aircraft capable of Mach 2.5 at high altitude, low level dash Mach 1.2. Oh, also we wanted to operate out of unimproved airstrips 3,000 feet or less. Low level radius 800 miles with a 400 mile sea level uh, to 200 feet at 1.2 Mach. Be able to fly across the Atlantic unrefueled. Didn't want much, did they? Okay. <laughs> 1,000 pound internal payload and lifting payload between 15 and 30,000 pounds. At the same time, ever since the shoot down, now that they, now that we know with the shoot down of the U-2 that the SAMs can go up to 60,000 feet, the Navy was looking for a fleet air defense aircraft to replace the F-4 and the F-8. And you're thinking, well, heck, the first F-4s didn't even go into the squadrons until 1961. But this is the way of thinking back then. So, okay, so February of 61. Brand new Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara directed the services to research the development of a single aircraft that would meet the needs of the U.S. Air Force mission requirements and the Navy. Additionally, the Secretary of Defense desired, desired that the new aircraft be capable of being used by the Army and the Marine Corps for close air support. Commonality between the variants were set at 80% for structural weight and parts count. August of 61, the Secretary of Navy reported to McNamara that this design could not drop that. Well, this thing's quick. There's a good shot of the production line. Two of them being built side by side. We get into the cockpit area. You can see one of the mock-ups there. Side by side seating. There's a nice shot. I'm trying to get to this. Okay, now, here, here we go. Some pictures here following. And I want to thank Mark Nykavell can't be here tonight. He runs the uh, Greater St. Louis Air and Space Museum over across the river at CPS, but he provided these next images for us, and they're great. I believe, uh, is it Ron Downey, Jack? Does that sound right? Yeah. Maybe some of these same Im images are up on his blog site. 
Which is it? Is he here? Ron, are you here? I guess not. He comes to some of the meetings. Okay, so he's got a great blog site with a lot of the, a lot of the stuff he collected at McDonald Douglas is up on that website. So let's look here and see. There you can see him coming down the production line. And uh, got it. I don't know if you guys can see that way in the back. This is the sequence of operation. And uh, basically this whole pod, not unlike the Gems, Mercury and Gemini space capsules and the later Apollo capsules, just if they had to escape and get out, they stayed in the cockpit, seated in their seats, and this whole mechanism started to work. You can imagine all the control lines had to be guillotine cut and, and severed wires and all this stuff had to happen for this thing to deploy and then come down with a parachute. You can see up here these wings were eventually eliminated. This is uh, dated 1963. So this was when it was in its early design phase. There they are coming down the production line at uh, Lambert. <coughs> There's a rocket test of the escape pod. Another view. And the back side of it, it kind of looked like, uh, I don't know, swing sets or something to be going down the <laughs> carnival ride. Yeah, tilt a world. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. So I, I wanted to throw this slide in here. Dave Lewis. Anybody remember Dave Lewis? Okay, so the McDonald guys remember. Dave was the uh, chief aerodynamicist, uh, came to McDonald in 1946, became program manager for the uh, Phantom II. But at a, after he had worked at General Dynamics in later years, and re, I don't think he was retired already, so this was around 1978 or so, uh, he was at a conference, and I'm just going to read his words here. The F-111 is truly a remarkable aircraft, but unfortunately is very heavy, expensive, and has poor reliability. Had more thorough trade-offs been made at the outset, it is almost certain that a decision would have been made that at a sea level dash speed of 0.8 or 0.9 Mach would have had an acceptably high probability of survival. The airplane would have been smaller, simpler, and much cheaper. The Air Force could have afforded many more, and the effectiveness of the overall inventory would have been much higher for the dollars expended. That pretty much sums up the program right there. So it still was a success, but it had a long uh, teething period. By the way, in this photograph right here is great. It's Herman Barkey and Bob Little also. It's another good shot out of the hotel room window there in Australia. Some more Aussie ones on the ramp. They were the last uh, operators of the type, and I think they retired their last ones in 06. Somewhere right around there. So the Lake and Heath jet. There's the infamous uh, torch. Where they uh, just light off unburnt fuel coming out. I wonder who this guy is. Let's introduce him and find out. So it's my honor now to introduce these two men I was talking about earlier. This is the uh, glamour shot here for Captain Doug Vasilchin. I hope I said it properly. Vasilchin. I screwed it up. I knew I would. Kennedy. And we're at extra special treat tonight. Where's your stepdad at? Oh, he's sitting over there. He fooled me. Okay. John Vasilchin. <laughs> okay. Now, this is what's really neat. I got to just say. So, Doug, you were flying 73 74 at the end of the war. Your stepfather was flying in 67, 68 in F Force at the beginning of the Vietnam War in F Force. 200 combat missions. Let's give them a round. All right, I'm going to hand this over to Doug, and he's going to talk about the F 111 as the aspect of flying. Here we go. All right, thank you, Dan. Great uh, overview on the development. Uh, I would take note that they never showed us any of those pictures of the ejection deal. <laughs> I'm not sure that we would have signed up, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Before I get into this a little bit, uh, a couple of thanks uh, certainly to, uh, to
to Dan and Jackie, Chase, who really helped put all this together, Gary, uh, John, several others. So thank you. It's an honor to be here with you all. I'm sure you have hundreds of stories compared to uh, some of my minor stories, and I'm honored to be here with you men and women. So thank you for this time. Uh, and speaking of honoring, uh, two people I'd like, well, three of you actually. So first I'd like to introduce my wife, Cindy Kennedy. Of, uh, we've been married 48 years, and uh, Cindy went through, we went through pilot train together, we've been through the whole, the whole nine yards, all the stories, all the heartaches, uh, and the times I was gone, so I wasn't so good. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Dan Burke, Dave Burke, and Liz Burke, uh, Dave and Liz are my neighbors, they're the ones that got me interested, along with Dan, into the Missouri Aviation Historical Society. So, thank you for this time. Uh, that's, uh, I appreciate it. And lastly, I want to say a little more tribute, and my wife told me I couldn't cry, so whatever, but uh, my stepdad, uh, John Basulchin, uh, Almost 17,000 hours of aircraft aviation time. Checked out in 36 different airplanes. Landed on a carrier, uh, mostly Air Force, although he talks about the Navy way too much right now. But that's okay. He loves the Navy and the Air Force. And uh, 205 combat missions uh, in the really tough days of, of Vietnam. So, Dad, he got me into aviation. And thank you. And stay with some of the, some of the timing here. A couple things that because uh, we got a video, and the video is going to be a lot more fun than listening to uh, to me talk. Now this is the uh, the Joe Cool shot. Do we have a slide after this one? Okay, that's, and then we're going to do the video. But I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, make sure did I honor everybody. I'll make sure I do that right. I think so. Okay. Um, so what's it like? being in a 111, okay? I'll tell you, the first thing I ever learned in pilot training, uh, and then later as an instructor, I have a thousand hours of T-37 instructor time, and that little Tweety Bird, that's where I really learned to fly. And what I always told my students is, you don't strap into that airplane, you strap that airplane onto you, and then you're in control. And that's all the difference in the world about how you can really uh, enjoy flying and being, and being a good, hopefully great pilot. So the 111, I don't know, I think most everyone in here is an aviator, but if you haven't, uh, I guess I would just try and parallel it this way, what's it like to be in a 111. Uh, we did get criticized a little bit because we had a little cop, so somebody said, oh yeah, they shut the uh, cockpit and it's air conditioned and it's a short sleeve environment. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. But I don't know if you've ever been in a high speed car, big Cadillac maybe, driving 80 miles an hour, and then you floor that thing and all of a sudden you're at 120? Okay, well, it's a lot different than 111, but you could be cruising in that airplane, which could go um, 1,453 miles an hour at altitude, and even though they wanted to go 1.2 Mach, it would go almost one Mach at 300 feet off the deck. That is one powerful TF engine, Pratt Whitney engines that we had. Um, so, you could be cruising at 320, put the wings back a little bit, jam that thrusters up, both of them, and you'd be at 540, 600 miles an hour before you knew it. Uh, it was great. In terms of flying the 111, uh, there's a couple of names I'll, I'll tell you about those. Let me uh, I'll make sure I kind of cover some of the highlights here. Yeah, I'll talk about the names a little bit and then talk about flying it a little bit more. Well, they called it the Aardvark. Uh, you know, the Aardvark is a South America uh, anteater. Uh, loves to eat at night. Got a big, long nose, and so the one that had a big, long nose, although the Navy version didn't, didn't have that. So it kind of got that name Aardvark. It also got the name Pig. I was trying to figure out why Pig. Well, 
it had terrain following radar that would just hug the ground, okay? And, uh, you know, pigs with their snouts, I guess. That's, so this is the, uh, I'm not too excited about those names, but uh, I'll tell you the one I liked. Came up with this one in, in Vietnam. Whispering death. Because you did not know it was coming until it was way past you. And if you were at, it could be night, it could be all weather, it could be socked in. Every other fighter aircraft or bomber could be grounded and the 111s were out flying at night making bombing runs. So it was one hell of a great aircraft and I'm very proud to have gotten them to fly it. A um, couple little sidebars. Um, some people ask, you know, what was your call sign? Of course, as you know, we couldn't always have the same call, call sign because Vietnamese would always be listening to what was going on. Um, so this is my other joke, cool thing of sorts. So my, my uh, call sign was Umbolo. Umbolo. Anybody want to guess what that means? Umbolo. Now hang on. It means the one. Okay? <laughs> now I didn't get a big head because the only reason they call me that was uh, over in Southeast Asia I was the scheduling officer. So I was the guy that would schedule the missions. He said, he's the one. He's the one to be nice to. Okay? So, anyway, I used to own the little. Anyway, the 111, just kind of talking about that. So, um, lowest we ever really flew most of the time was at 200 feet. That was in daylight conditions. Uh, maybe 300 feet, but mostly it'd be at four or 500 feet. But you can imagine going 540 miles an hour. Now think of yourselves flying along that fast, it's daylight, you're in and out of mountainous terrain or jungle terrain, you're out in especially Southeast Asia where the peaks would rise up 1,000, 1,500 feet in no time. In fact, that was how they lost a couple of 111s in the beginning because the radar was not picking up those peaks fast enough and they were uncharted. So there's a lot of uncharted land. So they just a couple of them ran, unfortunately, straight into those uh, peaks. But imagine flying, you're cruising along, now you come up, it's night. And then there's weather. And there's a lot of weather. And you're going 540, and they say, time to go down to your target area. And you submerge in the clouds, and it's dark, and you can't see in front of you, except you've just got your little terrain-following radar, and you've got your right... Cedar, your weapon systems operator. And uh, so I think it was a thrill. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you had to trust. And that's why I had the, um, you know, your sign up here, Missouri Aviation Historical Sites, dedicated to honoring the aviators, designers, and entrepreneurs who have kept Missouri on the leading edge of aviation technology. And I had, I've been studying this. Since Dan asked me to, to speak, I've learned a lot more about the 111. I didn't even know I was flying. But it's all the individuals, the engineers, the, the, the crew chiefs, the airframe people, the electricians, all of that people that make this come together, you know, whether it's the 111 or the other. So I, hats off to uh, all those men and women who have done that all these years and who will continue to do it uh, going forward. I think, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of, uh, I'm not going to try and give you a little war stories, we'll go into the film here, but I will say, because I was there towards the, the end of Vietnam, and other than a SAM site coming up and giving you a little pucker factor, I'll tell you what was really almost worse was the thunderstorms over there would climb to 50,000 feet. And, the, you know, the ceiling of the 111 was maybe 55, 56 combat ceiling. So you wouldn't try and fly over them, you'd fly in between them and you could see them. The only problem that was at night, when you're still flying at altitude, you could watch one thunderstorm sending a lightning bolt to the other thunderstorm in the air. <laughs> you're going, boy, I sure hope I don't pass through that thing at the wrong time. <laughs> but uh, at any rate. Um, the configuration, which they may talk a little bit about, um, so you had an aircraft commander in the left seat. The aircraft commander uh, was in command of exactly finally when you were going to drop bombs and that sort of thing. And then you had a right seater, which was a weapon systems operator. 
Um, sometimes it was a pilot, most of the time it was a um, navigator. We had great navigator training. They had fantastic radar uh, systems. And we had a little, this little train following radar thing that, uh, believe it or not, had a button on it that said, would you like to ride hard or soft, okay, <laughs> over the terrain? And uh, I'd rather ride soft, but we always pick hard because we wanted to stay close to the ground uh, as we could. Because, you know, back then, they really um, could not, the uh, radar systems really couldn't get that far down to the ground like they can now. You could, you could be at zero feet and they could pick you up. Uh, let me say just a, a little bit about uh, just the ejection capsule. It was a, an incredible thing, and I think, uh, I don't know if we have too much of that in there, but uh, I did, in honoring, now it, it's, I think it could be right. I, I'm checking the numbers because this, to me, was an extremely safe airplane. They said they lost 77. Um, I have the list of every plane that uh, didn't make it was crashed. Or the, or the crew, many of them, of course, made it because of the original design in the McDonnell Douglas uh, ejection capsule. And they ejected at high altitude, low altitude. Uh, they could literally eject on the runway with the rocket thrusters. Um, but uh, it was a great system. But there was about 121 airplanes that were um, taken, taken down. But a major majority of those, the ejection uh, sequence worked okay. Some of the problems were a little bit, uh, as Dan said, there was a guillotine system that a series of explosions that would go off, cut all the hydraulic lines coming out through here. You would you'd head up into the air. Hopefully the, direct, the chute would deploy because that would have been a bummer if it had gotten away from the plane and it hadn't. And then you had this huge kind of thing. You've seen the uh, Gemini or the satellites coming down. It was kind of like that. Uh, I never had to do this. I understand it was a little more advanced when you came down. And the other crazy thing, and I think the Navy had a lot to do with this, is that capsule literally could come down and be submerged in the water. Of course, you wouldn't want to stay uh, underneath the water, but it would come back up. And uh, you could survive in the ocean for an extremely long period of time, weeks. Uh, the stick had a pin in it. You took the pin out, and if water started coming in, you had a little bilge pump. So, <laughs> so, that's, that's all true. So, uh, anyway. All right. Um, I think I think those are the highlights, Dan. Unless you think there's anything else uh, that we should cover, and just kind of we ready to go into the film? We do the film right now. Yeah, and then if there's some questions, we'll do that. All right. Thank you all.
and we told them they could keep their capsules. We really didn't want it. They were too, we just had too many problems uh, with them. I'm not picking on you guys, but it was maintenance and everything else. Uh, I was at Plattsburgh where the temperature <coughs> regularly got below zero. And the uh, grommet around the hatch where the parachute was would leak and the water got on the parachute. And so you had a, a stone ice pack in the parachute. And uh, that was one, one problem with it. And uh, it, uh, the fellas just did not feel very comfortable with it. The uh, seats that we, uh, we all tend to like that. So the reason we got the airplane and the exempt from our airplanes went to the Australians. And because I followed the tail numbers, and the Australians flew them for years, and we used to play that game with the fire. Have you ever seen that? You go behind a tanker and you pick up, well, this is way up north, pick up about 20,000 pounds, and then descend down and go out ahead of him, and accelerate, and then climb up and hit the switch to dump. And then hit after burning, you have about a mile of flame behind you. <laughs> so you do that, and uh, then you come back around and ask for another 10,000 pounds. <laughs> so the Australians seem to do that regularly and, and, and enjoyed it. Well, I saw pictures. They're, they're, they're little shows. They're uh, Fourth of July and like shows. They would do this sort of thing. But they took all the airplanes now, and uh, they went out in the outback, dug a deep hole about as deep as this hangar, and parked them all nose to tail, and then just covered them over with dirt. So they're sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. I don't know if the engines are in there or, or anything. But, uh, so I flew them from 70 to 75 Plattsburgh, and the other wing was at uh, Pease, of course, was New Hampshire. Mm. We were supposed to have had seven wings and they wondered why our safety record was so stellar and it was we were all brought in by SAC to learn to be in the first two units and then we were going to be the command and staff for the rest of the units and so we all had I don't know 4,000 hours military time we all were instructor pilots we were all circumcised from day one and part of the crowd and uh, then they didn't do it so here you had a whole bunch of field grade officers flying with lots of experience. And the navigators, most of them were out of the B-58 and B-52s. Hmm. And they were a sharp bunch also. So uh, it was a crowd that you couldn't beat. And uh, I had more problems happen. Because we did the acceptance testing also for SAC down in Carswell. And we had more problems that we said that the engineers told us could never happen. Yet, by God, they did. You know. The interesting one, and I'll stop with this, uh, after this one, was we lost a lot of guys coasting out up north, coming out being chased by MiGs. And they just coast out, and they were, they were in hard drive, down about 200 feet, and it goes straight into the, uh, what would that be, the South China Sea or whatever. And bingo, they were gone, and couldn't figure it out what was causing it. And uh, my Nav and I, Pat, were up going into oil burner hangover, which ended over Princeton, Maine, a great long teardrop out over the Gulf of Maine and then back to Princeton and down across the back of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and the, uh, the bomb plot was down in Watertown, New York. Well, we got her down at 1,500 feet and we start going through the, the, uh, the check, drive, uh, check for the hard drive. And the drive. And, uh, we were only, what, 250, 300 knots, something like that, 1,500 feet. And uh, nothing like combat or anything, just cruising along and going one step after another. I had a book just like this. And all of a sudden she pitched over and went straight down. So I, so I took the, uh, yeah, go. sorry. Thank you. So, uh, so I, there was a toggle switch on the stick and I hit that and we leveled out. Told Pat to get on the radio and call SAC and the command post and GD, and I forget the name of the company in Fort Worth, in Dallas, Brown, a major TF. And we got them all on the line. We could run into a holding pattern at low level, just doing this over and over again, trying to get it to do it again. Well, finally we ran out of gas. It was Friday night. Troopers was almost over, 
so we headed back to the base and parked it right by the big hangar and said good night. The next morning, my son and I drove down and take a look at it. We went into the hangar and the airplane was completely torn apart and sitting all over the floor and there were trailers in there with all sorts of test equipment and all this. These guys were working all night long on it trying to figure out because finally they had an airplane that did it and it got back. And what they found was that the TF switch was for the pilot right over here on his left. And straight up was off, forward was TF, back was uh, uh, radar altimeter. And it was in a metal box that fit into the sideboard there, and a cannon plug on the bottom of that that you hooked the table to. Above that was the place where you put your coffee and your water. <laughs> On top of that, so it dripped every once in a while, as you can imagine. But when they opened the box up, it was full of fuzz. And the people who had soldered it used a solder that was not, what would it be, uh, <coughs> what was it, solder that was corrosive. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and it corroded. And so every once in a while it would arc. And, and when it arced, she pitched over on it. So that's interesting. I beg your pardon for stealing your time, but... <laughs> no, that's good. That's all right. This is just a couple of the stories that you... What, do you want to run a picture now? Yeah, let me, let me make a couple of before I forget. Thanks, Bill. That's a great story. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for our guest speaker? Go ahead. No, I, no, I don't. Truth of the matter is, I always wanted to fly an F-4. 
Uh, I went to the guard unit in San Antonio, Texas. They had F-4s, uh, but before I could get checked out, I was already on my way into business with my wife up in, in Memphis. But this other gentleman up here, my stepdad, John Vasilchin, has a ton of hours in the F-4, so he, he'd love to uh, talk to you about that. But I don't have a comparison between the F-4 um, other, other than, uh, I hope he's not listening, we could carry 20 times the bombs of an F-4. So, anyway. He'll talk to me about that later, for sure. Anything else? Great, another great question. I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know that we were that advanced. At least when the plane was originally thought through and designed. Quote: The stealth feature was its uh, low altitude. Radars weren't developed as, as well um, in the weather. That gave a stealth nature unto itself. Um, so, I don't, I don't think so. Now, some of the guys, uh, you know, also in uh, avionics or some earlier in the McDonnell Douglas guys maybe have some thoughts on that. I don't think so. Yeah. And, and by the time the, uh, you know, so what, 68, 72, by the time you got 86, the plane, you know, they weren't thinking about long-term things other than the ECF model. So they didn't worry too much about stealth. Great question. So, uh-oh, Dan. <laughs> uh, how did this, the wing sweep, was that like speed control or was it like flaps? So you decided where you wanted it or was it just automatically deciding what it wanted to do? No, you, you're, you know, we've all forgot to put the, the wheels down, right? Uh, it only happens to you one time in a 111 when we forgot to put the wings uh, forward on landing. But no, we had a little lever right here on the left-hand side. And... Uh, just, just move that lever and it had a little notches, you had a little notch, you know, 26 degrees, 45, some increments, 54, and then 72, full 72. So, the other way around going. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't make, you're right. Yeah, Bill's right. That uh, It was, excuse the French, back asswards, because you want the wings <laughs> to go back, you push forward. I don't know, I'm sorry, that didn't work. So, they did. By the time I flew, they adjusted that. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Good. That's fun. Yeah. Well, we landed at 26 degrees. We landed at 125 miles an hour, which not that fast. Uh, and with those wings and those forward leading edge, you know, the slats and flaps, you had a lot of lift, it didn't feel too bad, uh, and by the time you were going fast, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, aerodynamics of the plane were so, I use that word Cadillac, that, you know, whether it was all the way back or 45 degrees, which we flew most of the time at 45 degrees, it wasn't any problem at all. The only problem was when you, you saw on that when you're doing night, when you're doing aerial refueling and the boom thing is behind you, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in flight because you are, it's at night, you, you know, and you, this thing's coming behind you. So you're looking like this, you're back there and you're trying to, even though the boom operator's helping you, you just get so disoriented. That, so that was hard. And you had to be real slow because of the, of the KC-135s. You had to slow down for them. So that was the only hard thing that was a little squirrely. Yep. What, what was your cruising speed of Roma uh, uh, you, you could go out fast, uh, normally. Uh, well, normally, normally we did our bombing rounds at 540, 540. And you're or four, five, 480 to 540, depending on. You're talking 200 feet? Well, as low as, yeah, daytime, 200 feet, okay? Other time, night. Practice runs more at 500, um, and most of the bombing runs are 500, even a thousand. If you didn't need to, didn't need to push it. Um, so. What, what I'm saying, you could pick up speed, but then uh, by low level speed, 
Oh, oh yeah, in terms of an object you were trying to bomb, that, that's true. I'm sorry, what? Most of the fuel is in the, in the fuselage, but uh, yeah. no, I think it's 42 years ago, I kind of forgot. But yes, it would have been a problem. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think one other thing on that. I don't know, it'll come back. Go ahead. No, no, no crosswind problems. The plane weighs so much, even you know coming back, even if you're almost out of fuel, at about say 30, 35,000 pounds of fuel, if you burned off a lot of that, uh, you were at 55,000 pounds. So it was pretty, very stable aircraft, and uh, which reminds me of the uh, the fun thing to. Uh, dump the fuel and, and light the, uh, the afterburners, that was not allowed in the United States because they kept getting UFO reports. So, okay. But the Aussies could do that. They do it in their airships. I think we had one more over here. Yeah, one more and then we'll... Before your takeoff roll, it seems like you're on the brakes an awful long time with the afterburners on. Is that a procedural deal? You had five stages of afterburners. So you went up to, you know, stage one, stage two, check that, stage three, four, stage five. I mean, that sucker is ready to go. <laughs> I remember the first time, and I flew T-38s in, uh, in pilot training, that we went to take off, and I'm, I was so far, you know, you heard that terminology, so far behind the aircraft. I mean, I'm going like, you mean we're, we're already gone, we're airborne. <laughs> no, anyway, but the five stages was the main. I was trying to remember one other thing. The fuel consumption in five stages of afterburner is huge. I mean, it's like 10 years supply, 20 years supply of your, your car. So, yeah, anyway. But it was the five stages. That's why you were going through all those checks. That's why. Good, good observation that you caught that. No, not that I, no. No. Uh, it did have it had no drag chute. It didn't need a drag chute. It did have a tail hook, which probably was left there for the Navy, which they, they didn't use. Um, and it did have a prone. If you had no flaps, you were coming in hot. And it was hard, very hard, to aer aerodynamically stop the plane without burning up uh, the tires. I did blow a tire one time coming into Cannon because I had no flaps, and I think I landed at 175, 180, so. But they forgave me, they didn't say anything. So. <laughs> well, thank you, yes, sir. Did you change the tire? Exactly, it's a big old tire they changed. We better probably, no, no, you have one? Did it, did it have a, I know it had a lot of sophisticated radar for train fall and things like that, but you, when you were out in Vietnam with it, of course, you're away from any kind of, I assume, any kind of decent weather, Advisory. So, did it have any kind of weather radar built into it? Could it see the storms ahead? Well, it was, yes, it could see weather like a typical aircraft could see weather in front of it. But you still had, you know, you still were getting uh, weather advisory and, and that kind of thing. So, no color radar for the weather, but but some some type of no, ability to see. It. I just don't know. You hardly know. Right? Yeah, it's like driving down the railroad tracks and pickup trucks. Oh yeah, yeah. But I don't. Not so much of the uh, weather. I guess right, when, well, when you're when you're looking at like North Korean missiles, the weather doesn't seem all that threatening. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Well, been an honor to be here with you all. Thank you so much. We just have a little something we want to present to you. So, uh, certificate of appreciation for you coming out tonight and for your service to this country. John, Major, uh, 
here is yours. And, uh, Myron, can you get a picture there? successful they were and the things they did. So I just have one more announcement. Uh, who all is coming to our picnic so uh, Saturday? That's a good showing. I like that. Well, we have a little surprise for you. Yeah, I wasn't going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Yeah, so our dear friends down at the uh, Dixie Wing Commemorative Air Force down in Atlanta, they are... Uh, Last 20 odd years, they've been restoring a P 63 King Cobra. So, Dick Hyde, who was on our board early on, moved down to Atlanta a few years ago. He was instrumental. And when we got the Dauntless, their Dauntless came up in 2014. A lot of you guys will recall this. They were kind enough to give the late Tom Mohan, one of our Guadalcanal vet, a ride. Jackie got it all on film, and it was a great day. And so we have a chance to return the favor. So I said, you know, you guys are going to Oshkosh. Can you swing through St. Louis? Yeah, we can do that. So they're going to be here. He's going to get in here about 10, probably around 11.30 Saturday morning while we're having our picnic and pull right up front. We're going to top him off. And then he's going to go out to Smart Field, join up with the other P-63 from Houston, fly on up to Oshkosh together. So uh, bring your cameras. And, and I've saved the best for last June. I'm going to let you talk about the 50-50 uh, drawing. I think Dan needs a hand from all the amazing people that he brings in here for us. Don't you think? Okay, first I want to thank everybody for coming. 